Good morning, everyone. What a powerful uh, session from, from the president of Poland. Uh, it has, I was going to do this differently this morning and, and, and start uh, with a focus on unconventional war, uh, but he set up so very interestingly this question uh, in a very avant-garde way uh, and, and made one of the most provocative suggestions, which is merging the United States and Europe. You don't hear that every day uh, from, a, from a leader from a European country uh, that might lose votes at home in many places. But uh, I think we're going to set up a question with our friends in AV right now. So pull out your cell phones, and we're going to answer a question that addresses the, the transatlantic relationship uh, and the question of what is the biggest challenge facing uh, the transatlantic relationship. So could we pull that up on the screen? And our, and our four responses are that we have up here, and you may have better ones that you can tell us about later, but what is the biggest challenge to the transatlantic community? Russia, spying, climate change, or the economy? Let's see how this comes out. Will we get a big mu musical... Uh, uh, Crescendo here, and the answer, the economy. Interestingly, Michael Froman's session with the trade minister yesterday uh, might, might have been the most popular session of the, of the, the Brussels Forum. Uh, so Russia, 40%, spying, 4.8%, climate change, 4.8%, and the economy, 50%. So that's clarifying. I think that when we now begin thinking about the questions we're going to discuss today, which is the future of conflict, uh, it's something the, the, the Atlantic magazine, uh, of which I'm Washington editor-at-large, has been thinking about for some time. Uh, I don't know, I don't see David Ignatius in the audience, but sometimes the audience you want to have are not people in ties. I see Jeff Sessions is out of his tie, thank you. Uh, but when you, when you read a David Ignatius novel, the, the oh, you're here! I was, yeah, yeah, I was just, will you stand up for a minute, David? I was just going to comment that we needed people in black t-shirts and, 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 and who had tattoos and earrings and, and the hacker community because David Ignatius's novels, the last two of them, uh, Blood Money and The Director, are very interesting. They're prescient in terms of this question of the future of conflict because they take us out of the old silos of just thinking about conventional warfare in its old forms. And so when you begin thinking about the kind of conflict that they, I'm going to sell at least 200 copies of the book here, David, uh, you see things about financial intelligence. You look at the ability to track the connection to drones. A very, very different uh, treatment of asymmetric challenges. And I think that David has done uh, among, and there may be other novelists in the room that we don't know about, that are able to look beyond the conventional ways that we thought of conflict and move into arenas there. It's, it, it, it is a, as rich and diverse and innovative in many ways as what we've seen in the financial sector. Everything that is happening digitally uh, in businesses today uh, is now happening as well uh, in the world of war. And we have four stunningly great uh, panelists to discuss this. Just in my left, General Philip Breedlove, who is the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. It's great to have you with us. Michelle Flournoy, co-founder and CEO of the Center for New American Security, formerly the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. She's sort of, in my mind, the Shadow Secretary of Defense, since we all know she was kind of asked to run the Pentagon and deferred. Uh, not many people like that uh, in this room. Uh, Yang Jiamen is the President Emeritus of the Shanghai Institute for International Studies, and Marwan LaHood, who's the Chief Strategy and Market Officer for Airbus. Uh, please give a round of applause for our great panel. <clears throat> so, General, I'm going to ask you to start and help lay out this question as you see it. You probably have at hand more resources than, than, than anyone I can think of in the world to run a conventional war. But, but take yourself out of that hat for a minute and begin give us, giving us your insights into this question of a hot war as you see it unfolding in the future. Well, thank you, and thanks uh, for having me back. I had a great visit last year, and I look forward to a great conversation this morning. So I thought I would pick up in a place that the president sort of introduced. He called it the hybrid toolbox. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought I would open the, my remarks today just addressing this hybrid war or some would call it an unconventional warfare. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, to start off, uh, to sort of demystify it, uh, there is this feeling that it is something new and exciting or, 
or different. And it is different, but really it is a collection of tools that we've seen in warfare before. Uh, we in the military like to use a simple model when we teach in our schools. We keep everything very simple. So we use a model called DIME, Diplomatic, Informational, Military, and Economic. So as we dissect this hybrid war or this unconventional war that, that we see being waged uh, today, the, the new things are how these tools that we have recognized from before are now put together and used in new ways to bring new kinds of pressure diplomatically to attack a capital, to attack the credibility of the leadership of a nation, diplomatically to try to disassemble, disassemble those, those support mechanisms for a capital, those alliances, those agreements and other nations that are a part of helping a capital. So first, in a diplomatic way, to attack credibility and to try to separate a nation from its support mechanisms. Informationally, this is probably the most impressive new part of this hybrid war. All of the different tools to create a false narrative. We begin to talk about the speed and the power of a lie. How to get a false narrative out and then how to sustain that false narrative through all of the new tools that are out there, the social media tools, the way that we can use the internet, uh, and purchasing and employing uh, those uh, informational tools that get this narrative out. Militarily, of course, uh, the military tools are uh, relatively unchanged, but how they are used or how they are hidden in their use is the new part of this hybrid war. Uh, how do we recognize, how do we characterize, and then how do we attribute this new employment of the military in a way that is built to, to bring about ambiguity, employed to, um, to bring about ambiguity. And that ambiguity then to either be embraced by those who want to embrace it or attacked by those who see the subversiveness of it. And then if that sort of uh, unattributable use of the military doesn't work and the objectives are not being met, then a more overt use of the military. And then finally, in the economic realm, how to bring pressure not only in the more uh, uh, recognized economic ways, but in energy, in the use of uh, bringing pressure against loans and things. So, this new hybrid war really is across that spectrum of diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, just a new way to bring old tools together to bring pressure against How the much of that falls within your purview as you? So uh, precious little, frankly. Uh -huh. um, uh, diplomatically, of course, uh, uh, we, uh, we have an alliance that, that has great diplomatic pressure or capabilities, I guess I should say, but in the military, that's not our, uh, quite our forte. Uh, informationally, I think it's, some is a part of the military business because it's important that in an information. world. Do you have world, a team of kind of black-shirted, gothic, you know, goth <laughs> hackers at, at hand? No, in fact. No. <laughs> Do you want some? David knows some. <laughs> We'll leave that for other elements of the, of the government or of the alliance. No, but, but what the military needs to do is to use those traditional military intelligence tools to develop the truth. The way you attack a lie is with the truth. I guess the one question I have is you go through and you give us a roster of the way you look at how conflict is unfolding and these other dimensions of both how to respond to it, but also what you're seeing, because we're seeing, you know, particularly in Russia, Ukraine, kind of a gray war, you know, unbranded soldiers, uh, folks coming in, uh, uh, materials coming in uh, that, that, that Russia denies it are, are its own. I mean, it reminds me of the 50s, 60s, and 70s when both we did that kind of thing, but also the Soviets did that, uh, in the sense that you, you have, you're, you're, we're, we're playing conflict in the shadows. The, the, kind, the military dimension where you have has serious resources, but it, it, it looks as if these other dimensions, perhaps, which aren't under your shoulder, are, are less resourced than the military side. What do you think we need to do to sort of alter our frame of thinking of conflict that we're not doing today? 
Well, I think that uh, you have to attack an all of a government approach with an all of government approach. The military needs to be able to do its part, but we need to bring uh, exposure to those diplomatic pressures and return the diplomatic pressure. We need to, as a Western group of nations or as an alliance, engage in this informational warfare to, the, again, the way to attack the false narrative is to drag the false narrative out into the light and expose it. Uh, militarily, our tools are, are, again, available, but they have to be a policy uh, first, a policy decision. Now, Dr. Them. Jiamian, I want to jump to China for a minute. Now, have you share with us how China looks at the unfolding nature of, mm -hmm. of conflict today, uh, particularly in its non-traditional forms, mm -hmm. and why don't you offer a critique of what General Breedlove just shared? Uh, I'm a Chinese. Chinese opens our remarks by three ways. First, the world. The second, the history. The <laughs> third is old saying. So how about our worldview now? Uh, the Chinese, the mainstream, thinks that nowadays is a combination of both traditional and non-traditional security threats. China is facing great uh, threats from both sides. Look at China's periphery. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the Afghanistan war and the bombing and the shading, uh, shelling uh, at the China-Burma border. And uh, also uh, the terrorist attacks at the very heart of the capital, Tiananmen Square, so we felt uh, this the impre the very pressing the threats. Uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese history, uh, this is the 70 year anniversary of the end of World War II. China suffered a great deal during World War II, but stood firmly with our American allies our European allies and others, we won the war against fascism. And we cherish it very much, especially uh, during uh, the past 35 years of opening up and the reform. China enjoyed great successes in social improvement and economic progresses. Mm -hmm. So we value this saying uh, that peace for uh, rising and peaceful and development. And uh, thirdly, the old saying, Chinese old saying is a big reservoir. You can pick up whatever you like, but a good test is what the most Chinese are picking up. And that is, you have a better neighbor than a far distant relative. So we want to create and preserve the peaceful and uh, uh, amicable environment. Of course, we are facing a lot of problems and challenges. And look at the other end of the Eurasia, that is Europe, the NATO, and the transatlantic. Uh, as the president of Poland said, it might be millions of years that uh, the transatlantic verge together. But uh, for Eurasia, we are already together. Uh, so uh, we benefit a lot from the great works by Dr. Brzezinski mm -hmm. uh, of his brilliant uh, strategic thinking. And so we pay close attention. We want to work with our American and the European strategists to look at the new phenomena and uh, try to find uh, common standings in meeting with these great challenges. And of course, in the meanwhile, we have to work out our differences. Thank now, you. With, with General Breedlove's comments on mm -hmm. hybrid war, hybrid mm -hmm. conflict, information war, mm -hmm. I, I, I feel as if I need to ask you mm -hmm. to what degree you're worried about what you see Russia doing in places like Ukraine, uh, 
perhaps East Moldova, other, other places where this rise or exploitation of ethnic, ethnic nationalism, ethnic separatism in certain conflicts causes China uh, worry or not? Or do you think Russia is just a great, great country just you know, doing what comes naturally? Well, I see. Uh, it's very complicated. Look back into 20 years when the Soviet Union was disintegrated there was a time that both the West and the uh, Russia tried to come together. Mm -hmm. And at the point of time, even the United States and the Russians were called each other allies. Mm -hmm. But now what happened, we, we saw the Ukraine crisis and China's standing is very clear, first of all, we believe in and keep to the principle of non-interference. Secondly, we should look into the far more complicated historical and the present the backgrounds and the conditions. And thirdly, uh, let us think if there is still something that we can do for that. For instance, Russia, and the United States and the European countries work together on the chemical weapons in Syria. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, P5 plus one worked on the Iranian I issues. Uh, so China would like to listen to the both sides and try to reason. And uh, China hopes that the last thing we would see is the re-happening of the blocking between the East and the West. And this is not the final time that there is no point of return. So we should still work hard on it. According to the Chinese traditional medicine philosophy, if you build up the positive in the proportion, mm. the negative will be subdued. Thank Interesting. You. Michelle Flournoy, I'd like to ask you to sort of take us further into this arena. I know that CNAS has done a lot of work uh, in the issue of, of the future of conflict in non-traditional ways, but cyber, uh, we haven't talked about space, we haven't talked about a lot of the uh, other evolving ways, and, and, and you've also done uh, some thinking about the kind of gray conflicts that we're, we're, we're seeing. So what do you see as the, is, is the sort of litany of kind of new challenges that we should be considering? And secondly, because you've thought so much about policy and resources, how do we need to begin matching resources and strategy to these evolving threats? So I think you know, hybrid warfare is in the future gonna come in many different flavors. We're used to seeing it at the low end of the spectrum of conflict you know, from our experience as allies in Afghanistan counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and so forth. Um, we're now, in the case of Russia-Ukraine, seeing a very powerful state actor, militarily powerful anyway, um, employing hybrid warfare uh, in cross-border aggression and so forth. You can imagine in the future even, uh, hybrid, even um, more intense forms of hybrid warfare that in also include more traditional use of conventional uh, power. But I think part of what we have to anticipate is that and none of this is sitting still. Um, there's a lot of technological change, capability development that's going on that's gonna change the face of warfare as well. Whether it's increasing use of robotics and autonomous or semi-autonomous mm -hmm. systems, um, the development of di directed energy weapons, um, much more robust capabilities in cyberspace, uh, same in space, mm -hmm. uh, and on down the line. I mean, we could spend a whole session talking just about how technology is going to change the face of warfare in the future. But I think the most important point is, is the one that General Breedlove started with, is by definition, wherever it falls on the spectrum of conflict, hybrid warfare requires tremendous integration. And most importantly, the prevention and deterrence of this kind of warfare requires the tremendous capacity for integration. And I think where we are weakest at this point is in that integration and particularly the informational elements, mainly because in, a, in dem democratic systems, those elements are not owned by the government. 
Um, those are freely operated. It's a free and open media. It's um, social media that's unconstrained uh, and not in the hands of government and so forth. So I think it's that uh, the informational dimensions and the integration aspects that are going to be pose the greatest challenges in the future. Now, <clears throat> when Thomas Schelling received the Nobel Prize for Economics for his work on game theory and, and strategic gaming between uh, uh, the Soviets and the United States, he said, you know, people think that, that what they did is came out with a mathematical code that mimicked human decision making. He said that wasn't the case at all. That you had to actually teach the Soviets in that case the, the sort of thinking. It was a culture that grew up around it. It was a powerful uh, speech that Schelling gave. And when you talk about these different technological changes and shifts as contributing at some level to deterrence, when I hear deterrence, the other side needs to know on what basis it's being deterred, or what it should fear, or what the consequences are. So how do you, taking what Schelling said at one point, how do you begin taking these various elements of new technology being brought in, information systems being integrated, and sort of communicate, in a sense, to your adversary, whomever that adversary might be, either a state actor or a non-state actor, that they're going to pay certain kinds of consequences and thus begin to develop an ecosystem where deterrence can, can, can return. And I think it's a real challenge. Yeah. It is I don't think challenge. deterrence is easy in this world when everything looks no. so chaotic. Uh, I mean, I think we have to f start in each case by really trying to understand what a potential adversary or actor's calculus is and how do you best affect that calculus both with incentives to do the right thing, but also potential costs should they choose to do the wrong thing. And, um, and that may go far beyond the military domain. It may get into the economic realm or the, the realm of political relationships and isolation versus integration. And so uh, I do think you have to think it through very carefully. You have to be asymmetric in how, you know, too often we think in terms of very conventional response we have to be more asymmetric in our thinking about how to f affect the calculus of others. And then we have to be willing to communicate that. Um, I think after more than a decade of war, with all of the economic challenges that Europe and the United States have been facing in recent years, um, I think there is a weariness. Um, and sometimes that weariness translates into a reluctance to ensure that we are making the necessary investments and communicating clearly to be effective even in deterrence. General, I saw your stars stand up on that one. Did you want to comment real quick? <laughs> Uh, I think I'll let that. Stay. Okay, uh, Marwan, I want to bring you in. Marwan LaHood with Airbus. I, I, as I understand it, about 25% of Airbus's revenues are in the defense space. You know, everything from uh, C4 and and missiles and aircraft. How do you look at this broad question? When the, the uh, President Komarovsky was also talking about the issue of of, dispense, of defense spending and looking at at, at this question of. Uh, how much is too little? And so I'm interested in your perspective. I'm sure you want to see increase in defense spending, but how much is too little when it comes to your thinking about what's needed? If, if, we, if we look at that question uh, from a strategic standpoint and uh, realize that uh, our environment is characterized by revival or I should say survival of large scale challenges, they have always been there ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, if we assume that uh, uh, we have a shift from warfare to terror, mm -hmm. or if, if I'm more precise, bringing terror in the living room of each of our citizens, mm. because terror has always existed. And uh, last, if we consider that uh, strategic information warfare is growing, all our networks, all our networks are under threat. And we put that in perspective with... Has Airbus been hacked? Yes. By yes. Russians? Yes. I don't know. By Chinese? I don't want to know. By Americans? I don't want to know. <laughs> well, Got to keep we, it fair. We, we, have, we, have, we have been... We, we, we are subject to, say, more than one attack a day. Mm. Keep in mind that one and a half million people fall as... Uh, fall, uh, in, in, in cybercrime daily. 600,000 Facebook pages are destroyed daily. Mm. So this is, this is the size, this is the magnitude of, of the cyber attacks or cyber criminality. But back to my point, 
uh, if we consider that uh, the defense spend has grown by 1.7% over the last three years in the world, that Russia uh, average increase in defense spend is 10% over the last three years, and we consider that Europe is still in a defense cut logic, mm -hmm. I say it is too little. I say it is too little because what is expected is the following. The West will need coalition, will look for supranational legitimacy, and will operate uh, all around the planet. It is not that we can limit uh, the intervention or we, we can limit the, the areas, the, 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 f the places where uh, the West will have to protect itself. Interesting. Let me ask you all a question. I want to go to the audience uh, here shortly and just involving you. And if you're not, I may just actually call on the senator or others and, you know, without, without much notice, so be prepared. But on, in, in, the, in the arena, what occurred to me was if you look at um, Iran, for instance, mm. today, and, and one of the big criticisms of Iran are the development of transnational terror networks or networks operating through proxies. If you look at a, there's a lot of uh, debate here in the room about Syria. Syria to me has looked like a civil war with a proxy war built on top of it, which is what makes it such a hard knot uh, to untie. But there are big players operating through proxies. The United States, uh, I asked this of, of, of Bill Burns, our former Deputy Secretary of State the other day, seems to not play that role very well anymore. We used to operate through proxies in various conflicts. We would have agents that we would fund. We, we, we would move in these various ways. We've tried to some degree with uh, moderate Syrians, hasn't worked out so well. But I'm interested to jump back at Michelle for a moment, saying, has the United States, when you look at Russia, you look at Iran, you look at other players, the Saudis, who are operating so, so uh, actively in the world through proxy groups, but we're not. We, we, when we talk about involvement, it's directly Americans. It's directly American drones or American boots or American money, American weapon systems. And, and we're not playing the role the Russians are of deflagging much anymore. And, 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 I, and I'm interested in whether or not you think that is a mistake, that we ought to go it's, back to our know, toolkit of the 60s. It's true the United States does not support terrorist networks throughout the world. <laughs> well, no, not terror networks. And, but, and, well, yeah. that is what Iran is doing. Yeah. And, you know, and I think there's, you know, it's arguably what, you know, the, the kind of proxy war that Russia is waging in Ukraine is not right. something the United States would embrace either. That said, I think to take your question more seriously, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there, there, it's a little bit of an overstatement in that I think if, when you look at, for example, our counterterrorism approach a lot around the world, you know, as President Obama laid out in his last speech on counterterrorism, there is an element where we are really trying to work very closely with partners on the ground, whether it's Somalia, mm -hmm. it was Yemen before the, uh, the coup and the, uh, the revolution there. Um, but there is an element of trying to build the capacity of local partners to be able to deal with challenges on their home turf. Um, Are whether any of those going well right now? Some. 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 The ones you don't read about. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, but I do think that there, it, it, it is not a concept that the U.S. embraces as much as it has in past historical periods. And I think there may be times when we miss opportunities. For example, in Syria, I think the prospect of providing support to a moderate opposition was much more viable three or four years ago than it is today. Mm. General? Well, I, I think I would agree with everything that has been said, um, and, uh, and I would go back to some of the premises we discussed a little bit before and actually had a great conversation in the ante room uh, before about uh, the problems that you face trying to carry on one of these proxy wars today, the, the power of social media and the other things that, that are used to, to make sure that everyone understands what's actually happening. It makes it a little difficult. You know, in the uh, recently, uh, Minister Ledrian of France was in Washington saying that he worried that uh, we were not paying enough attention to terror networks in Africa, that they would, that they were already trying to reach out, this was some months ago, to groups like ISIS, swear loyalty, mimic their behavior. They were beginning to do beheadings and coming in, learning the social media techniques, developing uh, uh, 
uh, agencies that would essentially promote and market their materials, and which is part of, in, to a certain degree, the non-state actor hybrid war that you're talking about. But how big are we missing? Are we going to be engaged, uh, General? In, and, 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 you know, Dr. Xiamen, the, in, in China, uh, in Africa, China has such substantial uh, assets and people and investments. Do you worry about an evolution of a kind of new form of, of conflict? Some of what we've been seeing in the Middle East uh, and whatnot, but, but growing more rapidly and evolving in Africa. General? Oh, yes. China is uh, showing great concerns. For instance, three years ago, we ha had uh, the, the great evacuation from Libya. Right. Yeah, and then now we still have tens of thousands of workers in Iraq. Uh, people and is China doing anything proactively itself in cyber or dealing with uh, some of these campaigns on social media? Do you have, are you, are you doing some of the things that the US and Europe are doing? Uh, with regards to these groups? Oh, no, no, because... Uh, You're just letting it all happen. Uh, no, the China, the, technically speaking, uh, is uh, in the lower entron uh, mm. than the United States and, and uh, Europe. And, uh, and we, our influence is very limited. But uh, we are very much concerned if the beheading or uh, burning people in the cage happened to the Chinese workers uh, in Iraq. Uh, that the whole society in China will be burned as well. Mm -hmm. And we also think that uh, nowadays we are facing a very different situation, even compared with 2001 when mm -hmm. 911 happened. At that time, the terrorists were only cells and the invisible, but now they are. Uh, physically, they are they even organize the so-called state, mm. and uh, they are waging so the many uh, battles and uh, giving the uh, threats. So China would like to work with uh, the Americans and the Europeans to combat this new situation. General, mm -hmm. well, I would I would just turn uh, the answer a little bit to what I would call two things that we are uncomfortable doing in the West. First of all. In the West, we are uncomfortable in entering into an information warfare or exchange to try to counter these, these false narratives because we find it hard to organize how we will shape information apart from telling the truth. Uh, and so uh, we have... You're saying we're uncomfortable, but should we develop that comfort level? I think what we should develop is the comfort level to actually engage. We can't mm. win if we don't engage, if we don't get on the field. And right now we can't find our way on the field to do this business. The other thing I would uh, say is we're uncomfortable with the speed at which this happens. In the West, mm. we tend to wait until it becomes a really big deal before we engage. And I think what we learn is that if we were to engage earlier when the problem is smaller, we might be able to deal with it quicker. So I think the problems are just, we're, we're a little uncomfortable with engaging at speed and we really haven't developed in the West, although we have the best information systems Marwan? in the world. Yeah, I would like to, to, to add to that. This is the main change, the compression of events in time. Everything goes much faster because of the information networks, the social media. The, this is what makes proxy warfare Im almost impossible. This is why the proxy have taken their autonomy. And uh, time, time is so short, so we need to react quick. Just before I go to the audience, last question, General, but I have been blown away by the, the, <coughs> the issue that ISIS has apparently incorporated 18,000 to 20,000 foreign fighters you know, speaking 60 different languages, many of whom have had no battle experience before, and turning them into what ISIS has done. We've spent hundreds of billions of dollars training uh, in various countries around the world with um, some success, but some uh, failures, some significant failures, where brigades have just collapsed, and, and uh, where there's now a call for very high... What are they getting right in their ability to amalgamate and turn such dissimilar, untrained people into a fighting force that seems so effective versus what we're doing. Uh, and I think that comes back right down to that nexus of the future of conflict because they're doing something that we find difficulty in doing with, with, with constituents who have a lot to lose 
uh, in, in these areas? What, what do you think the answer is here? Well, I don't know that, that I do know the answer, but I will say this. They are able to reach and find out what is important to these people, what motivates these people, and then they create the, uh, an ability to fill that need initially through the social media, internet, et cetera, et cetera, and then when they bring them on board, they continue to address these, these basic wants that uh, of, of value, of mm -hmm. a purpose, a sense of uh, something as a part of a larger good, and they, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, they are able to reach into these people and find that motivation. Michelle, can do you have just, thoughts? Can yeah. I just mm -hmm. comment on this? I think that's absolutely right. It, you know, ISIS has figured out how to strongly motivate uh, uh, and incorporate uh, a certain uh, genre of, of people. I think when you look at the forces that we've trained and to the extent there have been failures, it's not because we did the military training poorly. It's because those forces were not connected to, were not motivated to defend their government because they saw the government as illegitimate or non-inclusive or non-responsive to the needs of the population. So it's, it's that political dimension. It's the legitimacy of the power that they're serving or the cause they're serving mm -hmm. that has led to the cases of collapse when they've, when they've occurred. Fascinating. Let me go to the audience and draw in here. We're going to go right here. I've got a two-part, sorry, Zania Wicket yeah, from Chapman House. I've got a two-part question. The first one is on timing, um, and this is to the general specifically. Uh, you've just mentioned how events are happening far faster than they were in the past, and yet if we look at NATO, we're not talking about f speeding up our decision-making in any meaningful way. Why is that not on the agenda? I mean, I understand, right. hugely politically difficult. Why is that not on the agenda? The other is I want to move to a different type of conflict. Uh, one of the questions at the beginning was mm -hmm. natural um, right. disasters. Climate change. And, exactly. Yeah. We can see those coming. You say we've got to move faster. We know that water is going to be an issue. We know that natural earth minerals are going to be an issue. We know that energy is an issue. Why is it that we're unable to take the steps now that, as you said, will be far easier now than in the future? It's a different type of conflict, but it's going to be hugely important. I mean, important. in this room, very few people thought that was a serious challenge. I mean, through 4%. I just wanted to, to note that, that even in this room yeah. here, it didn't rank highly. So the question is, decision-making speed in NATO, General? So, uh, actually, I think there's more good news here than you, you may recognize. I think, overtly, you see that on the military side of NATO, we have moved to increase our speed of response and our readiness for response. Um, it, it's bigger than the very high readiness task force that you hear about. We are actually changing the responsiveness of the entire NRF and then a small kernel of that of that very high readiness task force, the VJTF. Um, and we have uh, before the NAC now a series of decisions that would speed up my ability to bring that to the field. But um, you, are, I think, are asking a, a tougher question, and that is the political decision to employ. And there are nations in the NAC that are calling for just that conversation. How do we politically match what the military is now going to be able to do in its reaction speed, and that's going to be a great debate. Marwan, did you want to respond? No. Dr. Jim, I want to ask about mm. the question about climate change uh, mm. and have you address that, because mm. China, uh, President Xi, President Obama mm -hmm. came out, initiated uh, mm. a, a, a big leap for China, which mm -hmm. it agreed to uh, bind itself to, mm -hmm. to targets in 2030. Mm -hmm. but, but on this issue of climate change as a national security issue, do you think mm -hmm. China is stepping forward and is going to continue to do things that, that uh, because China is the country that matters most in terms of <laughs> bringing on new, new, new carbon. Yeah. So uh, thank you. where are you in that? I, I think uh, both China and the United States are the largest uh, two uh, countries uh, facing with the challenge of climate change. And there is uh, a process. Uh, at the beginning, China uh, was uh, taking the up this mm -hmm. method only uh, from the technical term. But now we look at it more from the, the social, uh, political, and the comprehensive way, not only 
uh, concerned with our own country, but with uh, the world. So that is why uh, China and the United States agreed uh, during uh, President Obama's last visit in November. Let, let me challenge uh, you a little bit. If, if I, I have the sense that China has to be dragged into these uh, issues like climate change because it feels as if it's giving up growth, it's giving up economic empowerment of its people, and that you have to find a way to bring it, but that China is sort of a semi-reluctant uh, partner in this. And I'm interested in whether you think that, if one, you can tell me I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and two, whether you see China stepping up much more robustly as a real leader in this. Like Bob uh, Zelik once said, it's time for China to stand up and become a responsible international stakeholder. Here's a great way to do that. So is there a way that you can move ahead of the rest of the world rather than just being meeting it at par? Uh, well, I see. Uh, the answer is yes and a no. Mm. Uh, as I said, it's a long process. When uh, we read the novel of Charles Dickens, The, the Foggy the City of London, and uh, when I uh, look at the pictorial picture books about uh, Los Angeles in the uh, 60s and the 70s, and uh, this was an ongoing, uh, unfolding process of a country with development. China uh, experienced this part, but now we are at a more the understanding and the knowing period so that the China wants to be uh, uh, with the mainstream, and if possible, we would like to be ahead. For instance, China wor works hard and uh, succeeds in somewhat in using the solar uh, energy and the wind and energy and uh, the Chan Chinese citizens uh, now are have a second thought because we understand the middle class now uh, is one of the contributors uh, for these these things. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, asking ourselves what an individual could do to reduce it. Mm -hmm to contribute more positively to the climate change. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I go right here, yes. Masaishi, Ambassador of Japan uh, to Belgium. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I just get back to the traditional threat for, for the time being? And sure, uh, conventional wars and, uh, on the table bring, too. Bring up uh, Ukraine, and uh, this is a question, yeah. a little bit naughty question going to, to the, uh, Dr. Yang. Uh, what makes Ukraine uh, truly a global issue, in my mind, is that that touches the basic principle, which is shared by most of the responsible global players. That is, you are not supposed to change the status quo unilaterally by force. My question is, is China going to be able to sign to this principle? And my, my belief is that I'm sure you can, and you do already, simply because you are already playing a very responsible role in the global scene, but also because you don't want to see Crimea happened in Xinjiang or Tibet. Thanks. Right. Quick, yeah. quick thought. Uh, yeah, uh, of course, China uh, does not want to change the state school by military means or by force, and China wants to be part of the, in, uh, the international order, uh, the peace and the development. Yeah. You, you encouraged yeah. us Michelle? to engage yeah, go each ahead. other. Yeah, go so, ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that is true as a principle, mm -hmm. How do you explain Chinese actions vis-a-vis -vis Philippines and some of the disputed areas there? Recently, the kind of intimidation tactics vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam. I mean, the impression that China is giving the rest of the world with some of its maritime activities in disputed areas is not that you're going to negotiate the resolution of those peacefully, but that you're willing to use your more significant power to try to change the status quo uh, unilaterally. Uh, well, see, this is your reading. Uh, my reading is a little bit different. <laughs> uh, well, see, the, the, the maritime disputes long existed. And uh, before 1970, the South China Sea disputes won't be a problem. But uh, only after the 1970s, there were a lot of reasons, uh, the, including uh, the uh, China's rising and uh, other neighboring countries paying more attention to uh, the, 
the maritime the territorial disputes, etc. And China uh, wants to work with them. And uh, we, 10 years ago, we reached an agreement with the, uh, they call the Declaration of, of uh, mm. the Conduct DOC with the ASEAN countries. And uh, within that uh, 10 years of time, China did not uh, change the uh, status quo, but the other way around. And uh, now we are working with the COC, uh, Code of Conduct. Mm. And of course, this is the dispute and uh, which we do not like to see. And uh, China uh, does not want to intimidate the others, but it is the same the true. China don't want to be intimidated uh, either. Uh, so it's very complicated to cut the long story short. I think uh, the best way is both China and the ASEAN countries, and the four of them, uh, should work together on the double track thoughts for South China Sea, the peace and the development of China and ASEAN should work together. And for the territorial disputes, China and the relevant countries should negotiate. Thank We're going to do lightning round of questions here. Michelle, are you convinced? <laughs> I, I think it would be very, if what you say is true, it would be very powerful for the Chinese government to pledge to all of the ASEAN com countries and its other neighbors that it would not, it is not, it is pledging not to change the status quo unilaterally by force. Can you deliver that back in Beijing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the lightning round right here. We're going to go really quick. I'll promise to hit as many of you as I can. Teresa Fallon, European Institute of Asian Studies, a, pr a question for mm -hmm. Professor Young. In your opening remarks, and this, I want to remind everybody this is about the future of conflict, you remarked that you feel China feels squeezed on both sides, Afghanistan and Burma. But it's interesting that you mentioned Burma because as we know from the media, there was a bombing recently by accident of four civilians in China. Do you really feel that threatened by Burma? If you could expand on that, thank you. Threat by Burma. Yeah. Zbig, do you have a question? No, no question. I, I can't believe that, but yes, right here. Hi, Terry Schultz. I'm a journalist with National Public Radio and CBS News. Um, this for um, the SACOR and possibly for Michelle also. Um, this morning we hear that ISIS has published the home addresses of US military personnel mm -hmm. and uh, called on lone wolves to attack them. Um, I'd like to get your, your response to that. And, and also, um, Russia is now threatening Denmark that if it joins the missile defense shield, it will, uh, it could possibly be attacked. That sounds like Bomb old, old war, yeah, old warfare. I'm interested to get your comments on that. And Great. also Josh Rogan asked about defensive no, we're just, weapons. We're, we're going to stop right, right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I know. Lightning round with others. Yes, go Hi, ahead. Uh, Tim Radout, I'm a fellow at GMF, and this is for Michelle and General Breedlove. Um, when it comes to the question of U.S. cyber doctrine, do you see a need for declaratory statements, <coughs> clarification, dealing with problems of attribution? You know, what is the U.S. position? I think clarifying would alleviate some ambiguity in, in the Let me get one, realm. one more, not to, since you're all right here. Well, okay. Um, hi, I'm Sohasini we'll Heather. Back. I'm a journalist from yes. in, uh, from India yeah. with the Hindu newspaper. Uh, my question, really, um, uh, picking up on what Mr. Yang said about the fact that the P5 talks with Iran, had they come a little earlier or been pursued more vigorously a little earlier, may have also had a kernel of conflict resolution uh, in terms of Syria. Uh, and referring to what Secretary of State John Kerry seems to have indicated in an interview from Lausanne last week, uh, the idea that now it may in fact be possible uh, to open some kind of dialogue with uh, the Syrian regime, with Assad himself. I'd like to ask General uh, Breedlove if uh, moving from the future of conflict to the future of conflict resolution, uh, is that going to be the only option when it comes uh, to dealing with ISIS? Okay, let me start with Michelle. <laughs> Response uh, to Michelle. So, um, a couple of things. I, I think that, uh, I think we are all alarmed to read the, the story about ISIS publishing addresses of U.S. military personnel, and I think that it speaks to um, the kind of tactics they will use and that we have to be prepared for, both in terms of uh, protecting our personnel, but also doing the very important and hard work of um, 
you know, engaging communities at home, making sure that the radicalization process has lower chances of succeeding at home and so forth. And I think this is even a bigger problem for Europe, frankly, than it is for, for the United States. Um, on cyber doctrine, I don't know that it's helpful to think about doctrine per se, but I do think that there's so much confusion about what we do and don't do and what's legal and what's not legal that it is worth trying to, clear, to provide a little bit more transparency and explanation and to talk about rules of the road. There are certain areas where we should be trying to take certain cyber activities off the table, uh, particularly between nation state actors. And I think negotiations and discussions along those lines would be very, very welcome. So uh, um, on, the, on the business of ISIS, uh, putting out there this information, I, I guess I would ask back, why would we expect anything different or less? This is just one more of their sensational tools. You were telling me you've got trollers on Twitter. Do, do they troll you on Twitter? Does ISIS troll you on Twitter? I have no idea who trolls me, but I get uh, trolled pretty good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Every time I say something, the first five things that pop up are all the negative uh, uh, about it. Got it. Okay. But, but back to this, uh, the one more thing on the ISIS. I mean, what, what we have seen across the last several months is that every time they take a defeat on the battlefield, or every time they're under great pressure on the battlefield, they come with come up with some big splash like this, putting out something to take. You know, this caliphate, I think, is under great pressure. And so they try to divert attention from what's happening on the battlefield by putting out one of these great splashes. To the Denmark and TBM, um, this is just the next step. Uh, Romania came under great pressure when they became a part of European phase adaptive approach. Uh, Poland is coming under great pressure. And now anyone else who, who wants to join into this defensive capability uh, will come under this, this diplomatic and political pressure. Remember the hybrid war remarks. Dr. Jamin, Burma? Uh, when I said Burma, uh, I didn't say China was squeezed. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, because China and Burma shared a long border, and uh, the, because of the recent bombing, uh, we have already had about 60,000 refugees uh, flooding into the China part. Uh, I visited the border several times. There was, uh, you cannot defend it. There is a village, they called a village uh, with two nationalities. Uh, so the, this shows great concern that China uh, thinks that the northern part of the local fightings mm -hmm. would affect China uh, as well as like Afghanistan. Marwan, did you want to give a quick uh, comment on the cyber doctrine issue? Would that be clarifying and helpful to you in industry or do you find it irrelevant? Our, our experience in, in Airbus Group is that uh, we uh, can only be strong when there is cooperation between allies. Mm. We've seen that between the French, the Brits, the Germans, the Spaniards, uh, uh, whenever the, these, these four that are the main locations of our, of our company uh, are cooperating, we are strong. And whenever they are not, and there are a few instances where they are not, uh, here's a great weakness. How do you see the trend going? Christoph von Marshall a minute ago said that a year ago you wouldn't have seen the attitudes in Germany you're seeing today. And when you look at the, you know, the alliance, the transatlantic alliance, sometimes everybody's on board, sometimes they're not on board. Do you, do you sense that there's more disarray down the road or more cohesion? There, there is, there is, a, there is a, a, a higher awareness for the need of, of cohesion. Mm. This, is, this is good news. Uh, we, need, we need to see that turning into action. For the time being, it's just polls and results. We need to see that in the action plan. Terrific. Okay, this is going to be real lightning round because we've only got a few minutes. But Steve Erlanger, right here. Um, thank you. Very quickly, if, if I may, for Ms. Flournoy and General Breedlove. Um, when the U.S. with Israel created Stuxnet, it broke a taboo. Um, do you regret that now? Do you think it's opened up an area of of cyber warfare that perhaps would have been best shut. Great, let me get Senator Sessions. You nodded. 
I think I was recovering from jet lag, man. (laughs) Um, This has been great. I appreciate your efforts and um, the conversation. Uh, Perhaps um, we could briefly have a thought about can Europe do more militarily and with their defense budgets? Because um, it's a huge economy. It's as large as the United States. And um, uh, we just approved a $600 billion defense budget. And the money is pretty wisely used. And you think Europe is just not up to, up to par? Need to do more. I don't think yeah, there's Europe any needs to do, I'm trying to turn this into a tweetable moment. Uh, Europe needs to do more. There you go. David? <laughs> I want to make sure that my colleague Josh Rogan's uh, question is asked yeah. of General Breedlove. Uh, General, the, the question of uh, whether the U.S. should send additional defensive arms to Ukraine um, is very much of the moment. Uh, you've spoken out clearly about it in the past, suggesting you think it, that this should be done. What do you think now? Would these weapons be stabilizing on the battlefield or destabilizing? We will take one last. Was Who had their hand up over here? Hand? No. Okay, we're going to go ahead, Christoph. Make it short. I'm Last a- time you were way too long. Okay. <laughs> Try to make okay. it very short. Uh, since we talked about hybrid warfare and also information warfare, I'm puzzled about the totally different informations, what is happening with Minsk. I hear the German government say, well, it's implemented. I hear NATO say, no, it's not. We can see that heavy weapons are moved out, but moved in somewhere else. But when we try to ask you, give us some proof, it never happens. This is not good for, for the German public that we have so different uh, approaches and, and information. Why can't you tell us more? Don't you have the information or say any reason not to release the information you have? Okay, information systems. We've got Stuxnet. Was Stuxnet a mistake? Uh, European defense budgets and the uh, question of whether we ought to be doing more to send lethal arms, lethal aid to Ukraine uh, and and future of that. Why don't we start? And we're going to use this as our final closing comment, so you can ignore everything that just said and go your own direction. But General. I'll choose uh, two of those to respond to because others can respond to the others better than I. On the issue of defensive arms, what I have said, actually never publicly, is what I have recommended. But what I have said is that I do not think that any tool of of U.S. or any other nation's power should necessarily be off the table. Um, In Ukraine, what we see, as we talked about earlier, Diplomatic tools being used, informational tools being used, military tools being used, economic tools being used against Ukraine. And so we, I think in the West, should consider all of our tools in reply. Could it be destabilizing? The answer is yes. Mm. Also, inaction could be destabilizing. I mean, we've seen a series of increased actions in all four of those tools of of power, military to include, it continues. So I think that's the other question that our nation should look at is in action an appropriate action. Uh, The last to the question about Minsk, is it implemented or not? I think that uh, lots of nations have very different views on that, that um, as far as NATO, we uh, have a NATO agreed set of uh, intelligence that is put out by the, what we call the NIFSI, the NATO Intelligence Fusion Center. And the view from there is much what you said, and that is that we do see the weapons moving. We do not know that they have moved off the battlefield, but we know that they are moving. We continue to see uh, disturbing elements of air defense, command and control, resupply, equipment coming across a completely porous border. So there are concerns about whether Minsk is being followed or not, and that is all uh, a view of NATO's intelligence fusion center. Michelle Thornoy. Uh, Two comments. Um, Steve, while I can't address the particular case you mentioned directly, um, I will say that I think in the future we're going to see again and again situations where Um, presidents, other leaders facing very difficult situations will look at cyber tools or cyber options as alternatives to kinetic action. And for a variety of reasons, those those cyber options may look quite attractive. When those decisions come up, I do think it's very important that we think about the precedent being set and we think about uh, the example being set set for... uh, 
set for others, we should assume that others will soon have similar capabilities. Um, and we need to think through the first, second, and third order consequences. We're playing, you know, chess, not checkers. Um, the, the, um, on the European defense spending, I just wanted to pick up this point. I think um, it's, uh, I, you know, I think we all understand the economic situation that Europe's been struggling with, but this is critical to not only ha see our allies spend more on defense, but to get more for what they spend. Mm -hmm. And I think the, that it, it requires a much more, a much deeper conversation about how we're going to divide up the labor, how we're going to collaborate, collaborate to feel the, the spectrum of capabilities we need, and so forth. So not only spend more, but get more for what we spend. Dr. Jamian. Yeah, to conclude, uh, I would say from an Asian perspective, number one, when I came here, I was wondering why NATO uh, succeeded and uh, survived the past 70 years. But at the end of World War II in Southeast Asia, we had a CETO, but it ceased to exist. So there must be some different conditions that mm. we have to take into our uh, minds. Uh, second, uh, how uh, Asian Pacific region built while learning from the transatlantic alliances and other relations. I think the, perhaps the ASEAN Plus uh, formula mm. would be a good way of enhance our mutual understanding and trust to make this part uh, safer. Uh, where you see, for the most part of Asian mm. Pacific, region, we are still uh, immune from wars and the battles. We must work on it. The last but not least, uh, while China, United States, and Europe could work together, I think we need a more strategic dialogue. We need a more professional military dialogue so we know each other better uh, than we can China is still growing, so we are still on the learning curve. This mm. is why we must learn from you. Can you give me 30 seconds on what China learned from Stuxnet? Uh, well, see, uh, quite, quite a lot. First of <laughs> all, a good networking. Mm. And a second, a very good uh, one and a half and a second track dialogues among. The third one, you, when you come together, you discuss things to the point. Mm. And this is why and how China should learn. And uh, by the way, we want to learn more about China as well. Not sure that was about Stuxnet, but we'll come back to that another time. Uh, <laughs> Marwan. I, I just want to agree with uh, Senator Sessions, not just because uh, Airbus is settling in Mobile. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, the, 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 the Europeans need to spend more. Hmm. Spend better, you're right, but they need to spend more. <laughs> uh, two numbers and I will finish on this. Uh, defense industry in Europe between 2002 and 2014 has lost 400,000 jobs. You, so you have 400,000 people working in other areas or not working. And the second, uh, the second number I want to leave you with, uh, Europeans are working on a joint helicopter, 14 allies having 23 different versions with six different assembly lines. Wow. I just want to say in conclusion, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation, and we could go on for, for many more hours and I think find it riveting. Uh, but besides uh, referring to David Ignatius's interesting novels, which give us a sense of what's, what's possible and what it could be really destabilizing and very different when it comes to conflict in the future, I also want to refer to Zbigniew Brzezinski's books that have, have been made a very clear point that we're shifting from the clarity and cohesion and, 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 and uh, the sense of structure to something much more disordered ordered, much less order and structure. Despite that fact, institutions like NATO, which were just a few years ago, uh, sort of looking at their navel, you know, their belly button and saying, do we have any reason to exist? Now, very clearly, in a, in a semi-conventional way, NATO has found 
uh, a real reason to come back. Uh, but I, I think to challenge ourselves, sometimes it's useful to look beyond the, the silos of the conventional, begin looking at, Bill Joy wrote a, an article in Wired Magazine some years ago that many of you might remember called, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. And it wasn't a comment on conflict, but it was a, co a comment about technology, about the massive increases in supercomputing, the massive increases in genetics and genetics work, uh, the massive increases in things like nanotechnology that could be put to work by, uh, in ill ways by others, where great uh, casualty incidents could be caused by very small players in the international system. And I think all of those have been highly prescient in asking some of this, these questions about uh, the future of conflict and where we might go. Um, so thank you all very much. General Philip Breedlove, Michelle Flournoy, Yang Jiamen, and Marwan LaHood, thank you very much for joining us. And